Good morning. Let's all stand as we begin our worship and song together. He came to live, live a perfect life. He came to be the living word, our light. He came to die, so we'd be reconciled. He came to rise, to show his power and might. And that's why we praise him, that's why we sing. That's why we offer him our everything. That's why we bow down and worship this King, cause He gave His everything. Cause He gave His everything. He came to live, live again in us. He came to be our conquering King and friend. He came to heal. And show the lost ones his love. He came to go, prepare a place for us. And that's why we praise him. That's why we sing. That's why we offer him our everything. That's why we bow down and worship this king. Because he gave his everything. And that's why we praise him, that's why we sing, that's why we offer him our everything, that's why we bow down and worship this king, cause he gave his everything, cause he gave his everything. You may be seated. <clears throat> After this song we'll have our opening prayer. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they well his birth. Glory to God in the highest, peace and good tidings to earth. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious. Sweetest that ever was heard Fasting alone in the desert Tell of the days that are past How for our sins he was tempted Yet was triumphant at last Tell of the years of his labor. Tell of the sorrow he bore. He was despised and afflicted, homeless, rejected, and poor. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell of the cross where they nailed him, writhing in anguish and pain. Tell grave where they laid him, tell how he liveth again. Love in that story so tender, clearer than ever I see. Stay, let me weep while you whisper. Love paid the for me. Tell me the story of 
Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Let's go to God in prayer. Merciful Father, Father, we humbly come before you on this Lord's Day, Father, to give you thanks for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. And Father, we are so grateful for you sending your, your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ our Lord, to this earth, Father, to lay down his life in such a painful and horrible manner for the sins of all humanity. For we realize, Father, that without Jesus Christ, there could be no hope for any of us. Father, at this time, we want to pray for those in our congregation that are on our congregational sick list. You know, you know who they are, Father. We just pray, Heavenly Father, that, um, that you would be with them and if it be in accordance with your will, that you would restore them to a much, a much greater uh, a better uh, state of, uh, of, of health. And Father, we also want to pray uh, for those in our congregation who have recently lost loved ones. Uh, we pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll wrap your loving arms around them, comfort uh, and strengthen them, Father, in their times of need, and help them, Father, as only you truly can through the grieving process. And Father, we also want to ask and pray that you provide us with self-control and virtue in order to be the best followers of Christ, Father, that we can possibly be based upon our ability. Help us to be those type of Christians, Father, that would be well-pleasing unto your sight. Let the world know, Father, that when they see us, that we do not belong to the earth. We are here on this earth, but we do not belong to this earth. Let them see that, Father, and hopefully, Father, uh, it will stir their heart toward you. And Father, we just, uh, we, we love you, and uh, we just thank you, Father, for everything you've done for us. We pray for our country, Father. We are concerned about this country. We pray for the leaders of our country. We, we pray, Heavenly Father, that our leaders, that in their hearts, uh, that they would find Christianity uh, in order to make decisions that, that affect so many people, Father. Uh, be with our country, Father, and help us to get back on the, on, on the, on the correct track, uh, one that would be pleasing and acceptable unto you. And Father, uh, again, we love you, and we just thank you so much for everything that you've, you've done for us. We pray that everything that we say and do here is going to be scriptural uh, and pleasing and acceptable in our, in our worship service for you this morning, Father. And Father, go with us now uh, and be with us uh, in our worship service. Uh, guide, guard, and, and watch over each and every one of us. And forgive us all, Father, of any of our unforgiven sins. We ask this, Father, and pray this, Father, in the name of your Holy Son, and our Holy Savior, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our next song, please. We'll sing verses 1 and 2, the refrain, verse 3, and the refrain again. <clears throat> Lo, in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior. Jesus, my 
Savior. Vainly they seal the dead. Jesus, my Lord. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Death cannot keep his prey. Jesus, my Savior, he tore the bars away. Jesus, my Lord, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. You may be seated. We saw thee not when thou didst come to this poor world of sin and death, nor yet beheld thy cottage home in that despised Nazareth. But we believe thy footsteps trod its streets and plains, thou Son of God. But we believe Thy footsteps trod its streets and plains, Thou Son of God. We saw Thee not when lifted high Amid that wild and savage crew, Nor yet breathe that imploring cry, Forgive they know not what they do, But we believe the deed was done that shook the earth and veiled the sun but we believe the deed was done that shook the earth and veiled the sun we gaze not in the open tomb where once thy mangled body lay nor saw thee in that upper room, nor met thee on the open way. But we believe that angel said, Why seek the living with the dead? But we believe that angel said, Why seek the living with the dead? on my iPad, I figured 20 pages was way too much to print out. I'm just kidding, it's not that long. Um, so the other day I was thinking about every, everything has become throwaway these days. When something breaks, uh, we just throw it away and get a new one. No time spent trying to fix it. And even people have become throwaway. If you don't like what someone says, we throw them away have an argument or a disagreement with your friend, just go get a new one. What got me thinking about this was my old Indian motorcycle. It needs fixing. This made me step, think about my stepdad. And I know my, my mind's a messy place, so just hang with me. See, that old bike was his, and he gave it to me, and I restored it. I learned so much from him 
Some lessons he taught without a word. I learned a lot about fixing broken things. He never threw anything away. One thing he said to me stuck with me. He said a mechanic fixes broken parts and reuses them. Or I'm sorry, he said that there's, there are mechanics and there are parts changers and that a mechanic fixes broken parts and reuses them. Sometimes things seem impossible to fix. When I started restoring the bike, I thought it'd be impossible to fix. I decided for a couple reasons to stick with my stepdad's ethos of repair as much as possible, not replace. Some parts I just knew weren't fixable. One such part was a toolbox. It was missing the toolbox that mounts to the rear fender of the bike. My stepdad said he knew where it was. A few days later, he shows up with the toolbox, excited about his find. It didn't look much like a toolbox. It was all but crushed. I wanted to ask him if he was crazy and what I was supposed to do with this toolbox, but I knew what he expected. He expected me to fix it. So when time came to paint the bike, I got my hammer out, got the toolbox out, and started bending and hammering <coughs> until it was fixed. I look at that old bike now, what I see is different than what other people see. They see an old bike. I see brokenness fixed. So on that day that I reflected on all these things, it brought me to another craftsman. He has the same ethos of repair, not throw away. It makes me wonder how many pieces of wood Jesus used that others would throw away. There was a man that jailed and put to death innocent people. Jesus repaired him. He became the apostle to the Gentiles. Everyone, even Paul, would have said that was impossible. He was fixed. A compulsive fisherman that acted before thinking, fixed. It was Peter. Sons of thunder that were ready to use force, taught to use love, fixed. Zacchaeus, Matthew, Mary, Nicodemus, the list goes on and on and on. None of them were thrown away. He lovingly fixed all of the brokenness. To do that, he allowed himself to be beaten, led through the streets to Golgotha. He was nailed to a cross to be spit on and made fun of. <coughs> At the same time, he prayed for those mocking him. Then he rose, defeating death. He fixed the rift that separated God and man. You're about to be handed symbols of his flesh and blood, not to be taken lightly. So remember him and what he did. Know that whatever's broken in you, he can fix it. He's the one who fixes broken parts. Let's pray. Almighty God, as we stand here this morning and worship you and prepare to take of these emblems in remembrance of your Son and our Savior, there are so many things that we have to remember about Jesus, Lord. The miracle of his birth to a virgin, a life perfectly lived in a sin-polluted world, and a resurrection which ultimately defeated Satan. But at this particular time, Heavenly Father, we take this special moment to remember the day he died for us. Help us to remove worldly thoughts from our minds and just, just take a minute to remember how he was falsely accused, falsely persecuted, 
mocked and spit upon and tortured and scourged and beaten, made to carry his own cross to Calvary. How he was nailed to that cross, picked up, dropped in a hole. How thorns were placed upon his head. And how he finally died for us so that we might have hope of eternal life. Heavenly Father, as we do that this morning, we pray that it will be a, a sweet savor unto thee. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this fruit of the vine which represents thy son's precious blood that was shed on the cross for our sins. Let us take it in remembrance of him. In Jesus' name we give thanks. Amen.
We assemble on every first day of the week to come and worship the Lord. To do that, we have to hear a portion of God's word. We have to go to God in prayer. We have to sing songs of praises, take of the Lord's Supper, and give of our means. The Lord's Supper has now been concluded, and this is a time that's convenient for us to give of our means. So as we do so, let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, creator of all, all that we have is because of thee. The blessings that you bestow upon us are eternal and forever and more than we can ever count. We are thankful for the jobs that we have that sustain us, the means of communication and transportation, the meals that we enjoy, the clothes in which we wear, every spiritual blessing and every monetary blessing that we have, Heavenly Father. We take time now to give thee thanks for all of that. And as we give back a portion of that which we've been blessed at this time, we pray that we will do so in the same cheerful and generous manner that you've given to us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you'd like to mark number 113, that'll be our song of encouragement after the lesson. After this song, we'll have our scripture reading and lesson. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along my snare away. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. This morning's scripture reading will come from Matthew uh, chapter 28, verses 5 through 8. Matthew 28, verses 5 through 8, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. 
as he said, Come and see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and ran to bring his disciples' word. Good morning. morning. Hope you've had a great weekend so far. Really glad you're here to start a new week with us. Uh, Easter Sunday is always a fun day. I've already heard some people talk about uh, some things, some gifts that some kids got this morning. I've heard talk about egg hunts. I've talked about family get-togethers and heard a lot of that. But I always love, like every Sunday morning, we get to start the week in worship. And so really glad you're here today to worship with us. We have a lot of visitors here today. Thank you for being here. Uh, We like... Like our visitors to always know who we're trying to be here at Great Oaks. Um, we're trying to simply be Christians. We put Church of Christ on the sign because we're trying to just be the Church of Christ, Christ Himself. We only want to claim His name, no other name. We're trying to just be Christians. We would love for you to join us in that. And so if you have any questions about Great Oaks, if you have any questions about Christianity, uh, we'd love to talk with you about any of that. We're really glad you're here today to worship with us. Hope our worship has already been encouraging and focused on God. Hope our lesson will be the same. A few things we're excited about before we jump into our lesson this morning. Daryl Martin. Daryl, would you stand up just a second? Let everybody see you. This is Daryl Martin. He met with our elders a couple weeks ago to let them know that he would like to be part of the Great Oaks Church family. You may have seen some things about him in the bulletin. Daryl and his wife, Marsha, who's here with us this morning. Marsha, we're glad you're here. They've been married for 39 years. They have two adult children and two grandchildren. Daryl's sister-in-law is Trish Patrick, so pray for him on that. Uh, Just kidding, we love Trish. Uh, Before we come into Great Oaks, Daryl was part of the Quail Ridge Congregation uh, for work. He was a self-employed mechanical contractor for many years. He now works for the Shelby County Construction Code Enforcement. He studied at the University of Tennessee Martin. He is a big Memphis, University of Memphis football fan, and for hobbies, he also enjoys boating. Daryl, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're part of the Great Oaks Church family. Meet Daryl if you haven't. One other thing we're excited about this morning, if you're here Wednesday night, we got to see Noah Neighbors put on Jesus Christ in baptism. Uh, Great night. Bible tells us, Jesus tells us. The angels in heaven rejoice whenever a soul comes back to him. And uh, Noah, are you, where are you at, Noah? If you're here, can you stand up? They may be at L2L. I haven't, oh, here you are. Okay, thank you. Noah's over here to my left. Noah, we're excited for you. Biggest, best decision of your life. And uh, be praying for Noah as he begins his Christian walk. Excited for Cameron and Lindsay, his parents, and the whole family. Let's start with a prayer, and then we'll jump into our lesson. Let's pray. God, we're truly thankful that you're our God. You've cared about us, and you've guided us, and you've loved us. And we're thankful that in your plan, you bring your church together to start every week. God, I'm thankful we can be here together this morning to worship you. I pray, God, that our hearts have been with you. I pray that as we've sung songs and prayed and taken the Lord's Supper and given, that that our hearts have been drawn closer to you. And I pray the same for our lesson. God, we're thankful today for Daryl. We're thankful he's here and part of our church family. We pray you would bless him and bless us as we serve alongside each other for many years to come. We pray for Noah. We're so thankful that He's made the decision to give his life to you. God, it's it's so encouraging when we see one of our young people make that decision. And we pray, Lord, that you'll help Noah through all the ups and downs of life to stay faithful. We pray you've washed his sins away just as you promised you would. God, we're thankful. Um, We're thankful for your word. And we pray, God, that as we open it together today, that what is said will be what you want to be said, and that our faith will grow from it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you haven't been with us this year, our theme here at Great Oaks is shaped by the gospel. Our young people are studying the book of Romans, and Romans begins with a statement from Paul about being unashamed of the gospel. And so we walked through the book of Romans, and one of the the great gospel passages in the New Testament that frames what we did last week and what we're doing this morning is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. So if you're keeping the outline with us this morning, you can write that in that first blank on the outline uh, if you're... Visiting today, I try to underline the things up here. Um, Almost everything underlined is here on the outline. I hope it will be clear as we go through it. But 1 Corinthians 15 is a gospel passage that frames last week 
and this week. And look at what the Apostle Paul writes. He says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and which also you stand. Let me pause there. We mentioned last week, some people ask, what is the gospel? I think this is the best definition personally. The gospel is what God has done in Jesus Christ. If you want to expand it a little bit, the gospel is the good news of what God has done in Jesus Christ. We call Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four books in the New Testament, the gospels. Because Mark begins by saying, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he tells the story of Jesus. And so the gospel is all about Jesus and what he has done, what God has done in, through him. And so Paul says, I told you the gospel. Verse 2, the gospel saves us. He says, by which you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Notice that it's possible not to hold fast to the gospel. It's possible to to believe it and give your life to it and then just walk away. God gives you freedom of choice even after you become a Christian. I hope none of us will walk away from the gospel. And if we do, I hope we'll come back. I hope we'll have the courage and the strength to come back. Verse 3, this is what frames last week and this week in our lesson. Paul says, For I delivered to you as of first importance, notice that, as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. So the Gospel, the whole story of Jesus, but Paul says of first importance in the Gospel, Jesus died for our sins, He was buried, and He rose again. And so last week we, we studied the cross, and we walked through Matthew's account, what Matthew says about what happened in the crucifixion. And we looked up from the cross. What we meant by that is, is we, we imagined ourselves next to the cross and looked up toward God. What, a, what does the cross show us about God? And we noticed probably a lot of things, but maybe of most importance, it shows us God deeply loves us. For Jesus to leave heaven and go through all that, God deeply loves us and wants us to be saved. This morning, we're going to do the same with the empty tomb. We're going to walk through what the Bible says. We're going to focus on the Gospel of Matthew. So if you have your Bibles, you may want to open to Matthew. I've got the verses on the screen, but you may want to have the whole context in front of you. We're going to walk through Matthew, what it says about the resurrection of Jesus. And then we're going to look up. And we're going to ask, what does it tell us about God? And what does it tell us about life? So if you have the outline, it, here's the way we're going to do it. You might can see I've got two main sections. This top part, it doesn't look like it on the outline. We're going to spend most of our time on the top part. I've got six little sections that I've broken in. I've broken Matthew's gospel down into six sections to help us walk through it. And then we'll roll through that bottom section of the outline near the end. I hope it'll be a good study. So here's the way we'll do it. Reminders about the resurrection. First thing to write down, write down predicted. Don't miss, this was not an accident. This had been predicted in the Old Testament. We'll see some of that tonight if you're able to come back for our evening Bible study. But Jesus himself said this. Let me put some Matthew passages up here. Matthew 16, right after Peter has given what we call the great confession. He says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Verse 21, from that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised up on the third day. And many people have have noticed how interesting that is. Jesus has spent these first 16 chapters almost of Matthew showing the apostles and disciples who He really is. He is truly God in the flesh. He's doing things people have never done before. And so people are, they're seeing his miracles and his teachings. And Peter finally makes that confession. I believe you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And now Jesus starts teaching them something else. I'm going to die, but I'm going to raise again. Did you notice it? I'll be raised up on the third day. One chapter later, chapter 17, verse 22 and 23. It says, while they were gathering together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill Him. He will be raised on the third day. And they were deeply grieved. They probably didn't understand. I don't know if I would have understood. I mean, Jesus has been doing amazing things. They didn't, I think they thought something different about the Messiah. He's surely going to, as they thought, He was going to lead the Jews against Rome and help the help Israelites get their land back. But God had a much different kingdom in mind. And so He says, I'm going to die, 
And then they're sad about that. They don't understand what's happening. And then a few chapters later, as he's about to go into Jerusalem for that final week of his life, it says, as Jesus was about to go up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside by themselves, and on the way he said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes. They will condemn him to death. They will hand him over to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify him. If you were with us last Sunday, we walked through those things that happened. He was mocked. He was scourged. He was crucified. But then what does Jesus say? On the third day, he will be raised up. This was predicted. This was the plan. If they were paying attention, and we'll see they were, Jesus said, I'm going to raise from the dead. Now, of all the amazing things they'd seen Jesus do, this one would be even above that. But Jesus told them it was going to happen. Second thing to write down, write down burial. The Romans knew how to kill people. They knew how to crucify people. We saw that process last week. And so they knew, without a shadow of a doubt, Jesus was dead. They, they killed him. They put the spear in his side and the, and the water and the blood came out. Like they, they knew. Professionals at killing people. They knew what had happened here. And so he's buried. Now, it's interesting because Isaiah 53 in the Old Testament was a prophecy about Jesus and his death. And it, and it had this little interesting prophecy. It said, he will be with a rich man in his death. And people might have wondered, what? What's even going on there? Well, here as he's buried, as Matthew 27 tells us about what happens, it says, When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. We don't know much else about Joseph. We know he's rich. He's from a place called Arimathea. He, he somehow heard about Jesus and follows Jesus. He goes to Pilate. He asks for the body of Jesus. Pilate ordered for it to be given to him. Look what Joseph does. Joseph took the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock, and he rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene was there, and the other Mary, sitting opposite the grave. Here at this moment, when the apostles and disciples have scattered, when Jesus felt as alone as he could have felt, here's Joseph of Arimathea who steps forward and says, I'll take the body of Jesus and shows an honor to the body of Jesus that the crowd sure was not showing, that the Romans sure were not showing. But he had his own tomb that he had cut out. No one had lain in it before. And that's where Jesus was buried until that third day in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. You notice the ladies are watching. The ladies had followed along through the trials. Um, only John the apostle was there at the cross. Jesus' mother was there. The ladies were there. Everyone else had run. But they followed along. They saw where he was buried. Third thing, write down guarded. Only Matthew's gospel tells us about this. That the Jews, the Jewish leaders were a little worried because they had heard... Jesus' prophecies also about being raised the third day. And so it says in Matthew 27, starting verse 62, On the next day, the day after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate. Remember, Pilate was the Roman governor who, had, who they'd convinced to put Jesus to death. They gathered with Pilate and they said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive... That deceiver said, notice how they're describing Jesus from their perspective. That deceiver said, after three days, I am to rise again. They knew what he'd predicted. They said, we, we might have a problem here because he told people he was going to rise again. So, please give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the people, he's risen from the dead. And the last deception will be worse than the first. It says, if, if, if we don't watch this grave and people start saying he raised again, we're going to have a bigger problem on our hands because people are going to really think he's something special. So we, we can't let that happen. And so Pilate says, you have a guard. Go make it as secure as you know how. And they went and they made the grave secure 
and along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. What scholars will tell you is, when the Romans put a seal on anything, you don't open that unless you're ready to maybe be killed for it. And so they're doing everything they can. We make sure he's there. We, we make sure that this is sealed. No one's going to take this body. We're, we're going to make clear to everyone that he is dead. But you can't stop the power of God. And you can't stop the plan of God. And so you may want to write down there next, He is risen. Because you'll see that quote a couple times in this next section. They thought they had it sealed. They thought there, that nothing could happen. Matthew 28, starting verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, if you remember in the Old Testament, the Sabbath was the seventh day of the week. We call it Saturday today. On the Sabbath, the Jews were not supposed to work. They weren't supposed to travel long distances. It was part of the Old Covenant. It's not something we're supposed to follow today under the covenant of Christ. But after that, Sabbath passes. So they, they let Saturday go. As it began to dawn toward the first day of the week. By the way, if you weren't with us last week, that first day of the week was somewhere around this time of year. And we know that because Jesus last night with his apostles was a Passover meal. And that's where he established the Lord's Supper that we took together as we do every Lord's Day just a few minutes ago. And the Passover, it's tough to know exactly what day they had it on in that year. Because the Passover, the Jews went by the moon cycle for each month. So we don't know exactly what day. But somewhere in the March, April is where Passover always lands. So somewhere around this time of year, Jesus is crucified and raises again. So after the Sabbath, as it dawns toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. The other Gospels tell us they weren't just looking at the grave. They were hoping to put spices on the body. We rested for the Sabbath day, but now we want to really give a proper burial to Jesus now that, now that the Sabbath day has passed. But something had happened, verse 2. Behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. Verse 3. His appearance was like lightning, his clothing as white as snow, the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. And I've often thought, I think I would have done the same thing. If my job were to guard this tomb and then an angel from God. And, and next time you read through almost any part of Scripture, keep your eyes open for the way God uses angels to do all sorts of things in His plan. And here, the angel is the one who comes and rolls the tomb away, and the guards become like dead men, paralyzed with fear. They didn't die, but they became like dead men, paralyzed with fear. So that had happened at some point during the night. Verse 5, the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. You know, they just show up, and they see that the, the stone is rolled away, and there's an angel there. They probably felt that same fear. He says, don't be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who has been crucified. He is not here, for He has risen, just as He said. Come, see the place where He was lying. And so they show them. They show them the place. He's not here anymore. Go quickly and tell His disciples that He has risen from the dead. And behold, He is going ahead of you into Galilee, and there you will see Him. Behold, I have told you. As the morning goes on, Jesus first appears to Mary Magdalene, and then He appears to those ladies as a group. Verse 8 tells about that. They left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy. Notice that combination of emotions there. Fear and great joy. They realized this, this is a power that we have not seen in our lives to raise from the dead, but there's a joy with it. They run to report it to His disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. They came up and took hold of His feet. This was a real resurrection. You could, you could hold His feet. You could give Him a hug. You could touch His hands. And they worship Him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and take My word to My brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they will see Me. The world would never be the same after that Sunday morning. Number five, cover up. This again is something only Matthew's gospel tells us about. Remember, they, the Jews were worried. The Jewish leaders were worried. Don't let people think 
that he will raise from the dead. We've got to guard this tomb. And so while the ladies are going to tell the disciples, it says while they're on their way, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priest all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, You are to say his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. You see what they're doing? We don't want people to hear about this. So we're going to pay the soldiers to say that he was stolen while we were asleep. Now, if that had actually happened, it would have cost these soldiers their life. They were given a task, a sealed tomb to guard. And so they, they tell the soldiers, here's what we're going to do. If the governor finds out about this, if it comes to the governor's ears, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as they had been instructed. And this story was widely spread among the Jews and is to this day. And sometimes people still, as they think through this, they'll think, well, maybe... Maybe the body was stolen. Maybe the body was taken away. But as people have thought through that through the years, what they always come back to is, here's the problem with that story. These disciples died for believing that Jesus rose from the dead. They went out and you couldn't shut them up. They told everybody, Jesus is risen. He really is God. You need to give your life to Him. And they were killed for it. I don't know about you, but I would not die for a lie. And right before they brought the axe down on my throat, I think I would speak up and say, we stole it. It's not, he didn't rise. It was a, it was a trick. It was a prank. The, people died for this. The, the body was never found. All you had to do to end the, end the Christian movement, to end the way the world was always going to be changed, all you had to do was show the body of Jesus. He didn't really raise. Here he is. He, he didn't really, he's not really God. Look, he's dead. That's all that had to happen. And it never happened because it couldn't happen. He really did raise from the dead. This is, this is God himself in the flesh. Then the last thing I've got that Matthew has here in Matthew's gospel, alive forever. Jesus wouldn't die again at a later time. Um, he would ascend back to the right hand of the throne of God. And notice these last three verses of Matthew's gospel. Jesus came up and spoke to them. He finally meets them back in Galilee. There's several meetings in between, but he finally meets them back in Galilee. He says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus, how do you want us to make disciples, make followers? You're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Don't miss how Matthew's gospel ends. Jesus saying, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. As we remind ourselves of that empty tomb, and we try to look up toward God and ask ourselves, what does it tell us about God? What rises to the top of that question? Because there's probably several things. I mean, you could say this shows us the plan of God, how He brought it all together. This was predicted and it happened. You could point out that this shows us how God has an amazing ability to turn bad things into good things. How, how He takes, takes it from the cross of Friday to the resurrection of Sunday morning. And those are, those are both true. But I think the thing that Scripture mentions most when it looks back on the resurrection about God, is it reminds us of God's power. The cross reminded us of God's love. He deeply, deeply loves us. The cross, excuse me, the tomb reminds us of God's power. The cross shows His love. The tomb shows His power. Um, what does the Bible say about God's power and the resurrection? Let me put a few verses up here. Romans 1 verse 4 says, Jesus was declared the Son of God with power, how? By the resurrection of the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. He showed that He really is God's Son, with power, by the fact that He was raised from the dead. Acts 2, verse 24, Peter stands up and preaches to a crowd of several thousand in Jerusalem after Jesus is raised from the dead. He says, God raised Him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for Him to be held in its power. Jesus is more powerful than death. 
In fact, as 1 Corinthians will later say it, we're all promised to rise from the dead at the end of time because Jesus has conquered death. And for some, that will be a resurrection of life if we're with Jesus. For some, it will be a resurrection of death if we're not. But Jesus has conquered death. He's more powerful than death itself. What about Philippians 3.10? Paul says, I want to know Him and the power of His resurrection. What are you saying there, Paul? I want to know the power of His resurrection. I I think what Paul is saying is, I want to see that power that God showed in the empty tomb. I want to see God show that in my faith and my life as well. So let's think about that for a second. As we go back to the empty tomb, we look up and remind ourselves of God's power, let's, let's look inward also because it reminds us of that. I need to ask myself, do I trust God's power? If you're a Christian here today, you've put your life into the power and the salvation of God. But sometimes it's hard to trust it. Sometimes it's hard to trust that God really is still God and King over His world and and really is in control of the future and we have worries and fears and all sorts of things that we roll around our heads. Let's not forget, this is the God who raises people from the dead. This is the God who who changed the world forever. And sometimes we look at the future and we say, boy, I just don't know where the world's going. Or I look at my life and I say, I I just don't know if I can change. Maybe I've taken too many wrong turns and I can't change. Let's go back to the empty tomb and remind ourselves who we're talking about here. This is God. This is the God who's changed the world. Do I trust God's promises? If He's big enough to raise Jesus from the dead, don't forget He promised He was going to do that. He's made some promises to you and me also. Promises about eternity, that there really is a home waiting for us. Jesus says in John 14, I've got to prepare a place for you. And There's many houses, there's many rooms in my Father's mansion or houses in my Father's kingdom, whatever your translation says on that. He says, but if it wasn't that way, I would have told you. There is a place. There are rooms in my Father's house. I'm ready for you to have... Do I, do I believe that? Jesus says, all things work together for good. God says that, Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to those who love God. Do I believe that? Jesus says, seek me first and you'll have what you need in life, Matthew 6, 33. Do I believe that? Go back to the empty tomb when you have fears and worries. Remind yourself who we're talking about here. Do I trust God's presence? One of the most encouraging things to me is to see fellow Christians go through difficulty with faith. And we've had people this year in our church family face cancer with faith. We've had people face financial struggles with faith. We've had people face family issues with faith. How do you do that? I mean, the world's hard and it, and it hurts. I think you go back to the empty tomb and you remind yourself, Jesus is alive And he said, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And that we can face things knowing God is going to be alongside us. So we see God's power and it should shape the way we see the world. And then one last thing here. I hope we look outward from the empty tomb also. I put up here 1 Peter 1.3 where it says, We're born again to a living hope. How? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are the people if we realize who we're worshiping and following, we're the people who can look forward and hope because we know what God can do. We've seen Him do it before and He can always do it again. Bring change and bring strength and bring His power into the world. We're the ones who have a living hope. We want everybody to have that. God wants everybody to have that. And so we look outward realizing people need to see. With all the sin that hurts and messes up our lives and breaks our relationships and breaks our world. People need to know God has the power to overcome sin and death. And He showed us that when Jesus was raised from the dead. You know, all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all end with the death and resurrection of Jesus. And after Jesus is raised in all four, it it points out, He tells His disciples, now go tell everybody about this. Go tell everybody. He wants the whole world to know what He's done for us. It's always encouraging to me, I hope it's encouraging to you, to go back to what God did through Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. He lived, He he taught, He healed, he, He lived the best life that's ever been lived, 
He died on the cross to save us from our sins, and He rose on the third day, on that Sunday morning 2,000 years ago, changing the world forever. My last thought is this one. May we remember our faith is not just in a way of life. Now hear me correctly. We do commit to a way of life. When you become a Christian, you you commit to things that are right and things that are wrong. You're trying to live for God. You're trying to not live for sin. But we don't, notice that word, it's not just a way of life. We commit to the Lord, King of kings, Lord of lords, who is alive, who, who came and lived and died and rose again, and who has all authority. He is the one who has power over death, He's the one who has power over eternity. He's the one who has power over the future. I hope you and I have given our lives to Him. If we haven't, let's do that. If we've stepped away, let's recommit ourselves to it. Let's make sure we're following the risen Jesus Christ today. If you're not a Christian this morning or if you've wandered away from God, we hope you'll take whatever steps need to be taken to fix that. We'd love to talk with you. Our our honest goal here at Great Oaks, our honest goal is to help each other follow Jesus Christ. If you'd like to talk privately, we'd love to talk with you about faith, about being baptized into Jesus, about getting your life right with the Lord. We're about to sing a song of invitation. And this song is an opportunity for anybody to take a public step of faith if they'd like to. Maybe today you'd like to do exactly what they did in the Bible to become a Christian. That's how you do it. This is where God's promises are. When people heard about Jesus, they asked the question, verse 37, what do I do? They're asking, what do I do to be saved? The answer in Acts 2.38 is still the same answer today. Repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you haven't been baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, we hope you're thinking about that, praying about that. If you're ready today, we'd love to see you take that step. Or if you'd like for us to pray for you about anything going on in your life, we'd love to do that as well. For you to respond publicly this morning, you're invited to come to the front now while we stand and while we sing. Is the grace of the Savior for sinners like me, sent from the Father? And it thrills my soul just to feel and to know that His blood makes me whole. His grace reaches me, yes, His grace reaches me and will last through eternity.
seated. Sing verses one and two. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. We'll sing all three verses. All to Jesus I surrender all, to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily. Surrender humbly at 
his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. Give myself to thee. Fill me with thy love and power. Let thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee. My blessed Savior, I surrender all. Let's go to number two. <clears throat> Sing verse one, three, four, and five. <clears throat> We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the God of all grace, who has bought us and sought us and guided our ways. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Turn number 902. <clears throat> 902. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing this my plea, Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus.
Tyler, we're excited for you. Uh, best decision of your life. We're thankful for the faith that's in your family. We're thankful to see you making that same step for yourself. I ask you before these witnesses, do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yes, I do. We know you do. It's only through him that we have salvation. Based on that confession of faith, I'm now going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins. Take a deep breath. Number 683. I am I no more. I am I no more. I've been bought with blood. I am I no more. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my Lord. And he rules my life. Jesus is my Lord. I am I no more. I am I no more. I've been bought with blood. I am I no more. It's been a good day to be here. <clears throat> Got just a few announcements before we end today. Um, if you're visiting with us, we're very happy that you've been here today, and we'd like to get to know you, so hang around and let us, let us do just that, get to know you a little better. Don't forget, we have services this evening at 5, so we welcome you back to that as well. Also, uh, services uh, Wednesday afternoon at 2, and also our regular services at 7. And don't forget that we'll have two elders in the elders' room after the service. If there's anything that you want us to talk with you about or pray with you about, we'd be really happy to do that. Just a few announcements before we end here. Sympathy is extended in the family of Joseph and Melissa Smith in the passing of his mother, Vera, this morning. Visitation is Tuesday from 1 to 2 p.m. in the memorial service at 2 p.m. at Roller Farmers Union Funeral Home in Jonesboro, Arkansas. In lieu of flowers, the family requests donations to Douglas County Church of Christ in Superior, Wisconsin. Mike and Becky Morrison would also like to thank everyone for all the cards, sympathies, and prayers that have been offered on behalf of her father when he passed as well. Congratulations to Vanessa and Lucas, I'm going to try this last name, <clears throat> Il Gunatis, I think, who were married yesterday afternoon at Great Oaks. So congratulations to them. Please also pray for Patricia Binkley, the sister of Rebecca Pack. Uh, Patricia's on life support after suffering a cardiac arrest, and she's in Maury Regional Hospital in Columbia. And so the family would really appreciate prayers for that. Before I offer the closing prayer, in light of everything that we've heard today, I want to read to you from Philippians 3, verse 20 and 21. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, dear Lord, we are so grateful that we've been allowed to be here today to offer up this praise and worship to you. We pray, Lord, that it was a good sacrifice to you and that you were pleased with it. We're so thankful, Lord, for the message that we've heard once again about your word that Jesus is our Lord and that he was willing to die for us, but that through your power that he was raised again. 
And we know, Lord, that if we are faithful children of yours, that when we pass, we will also be raised again to see your glory in heaven. We are also grateful, Lord, for our new brother in Christ. We pray that you will strengthen him, and that you will help his faith to grow each and every day, and that you will help us as his brothers and sisters to encourage him in every way that we can in order to strengthen him. We also pray for Kathy again, for she is our beloved sister, and we want her to know that we pray for her and love her each and every day. Please watch over us as we leave here. Forgive us our sins, and in Christ's name we pray. Amen.